Okay, so, uh, well, depending on where you are uh, in the world, um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about how we can deliver business value um, and uh, produce rapid deployment through testing in Data Vault uh, 2.0. So, take you through uh, about what we're going to go over in this talk today. So, I'm going to give you a little bit about myself, um, sort of my background, um, how I got into uh, working uh, data vault with Neil and becoming a data engineer. And then I want to sort of go into a little bit of a scenario about uh, what I've seen when we've been uh, starting data vault projects um, in, in clients. And then I'm going to take a step back and we're going to look at sort of testing about uh, sort of where the origins of test-driven development come from and sort of the different layers of testing within test-driven development. And then we're gonna look at applying some of this to the data vault 2.0 method. Now, this may be something that some of you guys are doing already, but it's something that we found uh, within data vault that has really um, allowed us to excel in clients. And then we're gonna talk about what business value that's delivering uh, to the business uh, through that testing. So about me, uh, so again, yeah, I'm Chris, uh, as, as Neil kindly introduced me, uh, I'm a consultant data engineer here at DataVault. Um, I've been working with DataVault for approximately about four years now. Um, I was lucky enough to graduate from the University of Portsmouth uh, from a physics of astrophysics and cosmology degree. I started working with Neil uh, through some summer placements, eventually went on full time and from there got put into clients and have continued to build my skills um, through those clients and about in 2021 i think height of covid um, i was able to get my data vault 2.0 qualified practice practitioner um, certification so my experience with data vault so far um, we one of the main projects that i worked on was a government client um, and we were able to implement a data vault using Wearscape uh, in an Azure cloud environment, which was a really interesting project. Uh, faced, it, faced quite a few challenges, especially around uh, sort of networking and security side of things. Um, I, one of the developers, well, now many developers of our Automate DV tool, formerly known as uh, DBT Vault. Um, and through these projects, I've had experience with both AWS and Azure infrastructure via Terraform. So if any of you are unfamiliar with Terraform, it's essentially an open source uh, piece of software that allows you to build infrastructure as code. Um, and as Neil said, I primarily um, have been testing data warehouses as well as data loading applications throughout my time with DataVault. Okay, so let's have a look at what we see as a typical scenario when we go into clients. So a typical scenario uh, that we see is that when you start, you're going to have a team and there are going to be users that may have some or a little bit of data vault um, to or data warehousing experience. Now, what we found is that with traditional data warehousing techniques, um, there's a lot of planning up front, and they can often rely on all the source systems having to be integrated before deploying. And a big issue with this, especially with clients who are coming in um, and say are wanting initial proof of concepts before they invest a lot of money, is that they're not going to be seeing business value for a while using these traditional warehousing techniques. And then, as most of you know, with the Data Vault 2.0, Agile method, it allows for that incremental building of a data warehouse. So this gives us an opportunity to enable us as a team to do step-by-step -step delivery of business value to users. If we're smart about it and we pick items that are gonna give the most business value to the users, um, then that we can really make the most of that initial sort of trial period. However, build, incrementally building a data vault 2.0 warehouse is one thing, but building a robust and trustworthy solution 
is another. So when you go in, there are going to be stakeholders and users that have uh, that have needs. You know, there's going to be people like business analysts, and these guys. You know, what information do they hold? They hold uh, business logic, um, presentation layer requirements, um, and they're also going to need to trust the data that they're going to be passing to management because if they're not trusting the data that they're going to be passing on, then that's going to hinder any insights um, that the business are going to be able to pull from it. You know, they need to have reliable data in order to make um, the correct decisions uh, to enable their business. Other stakeholders could be people such as IT and security. Um, although they might not be direct stakeholders, they are going to be getting a bit uh, hot under the collar for stuff like compliance, making sure that we're aligning with regulations, we've got the correct data security in place, only the correct people have a certain access. And if you're in, um, in Europe, then you also have GDPR regulations um, to account for. And finally, you've got the, the, the main people, the people that control um, the projects and the money, and that's the, that's the management. They, they need the reliable data um, in order to acquire these insights that the business analysts produce to them and use this to help make decisions. You know, if, if they're getting the wrong insights, then the wrong decisions are going to be made and, you know, people, people could be affected by that and businesses as well. So the first thing that I've noticed when we've gone into new teams um, or, or new clients is that the first thing we need to do is we need to build up trust. Okay. Now, there may be a lack of trust or even some distrust initially, especially for us coming in as consultants. Um, and there could be several reasons for this. You know, they could have had uh, previous contractors um, or teams or people that have failed to deliver what they're trying to do, or they've had really long wait times. You know, they've had to wait a long time to see any business value. And there's also uh, an aspect for the stakeholders or the users is that their job security. You know, if they're producing the wrong information, then that could mean that, um, <coughs> sorry, apologies. Um, this could mean that wrong decisions are made and then people could be getting fired. That, that's, that's, you know, the whole point of job security. And again, unreliable data is, is not producing the results they need. So how, what do we need to do in order to rebuild that? So we need to be able to, whatever we deliver in those initial weeks needs to be working and risk, risk mitigated. So this can be your, your code, your software, and your data. And if we're delivering that regularly, then that's gonna really help show that, okay, we've hired the right people here. And as I mentioned earlier, if we're delivering small win but high business value chunks then we can really make an impact when we when we start kick off a project okay so i said risk mitigated not risk free because even though you know you can have all the tests in the world there might be some cases that you occasionally miss however risk mitigated because we will remove a whole load of bugs and reduce the chance of messing up data in production um, by, by testing. So we can reduce this risk mitigated business value by testing. So today I'm going to go about how we can satisfy user demands with testing. And we can begin at looking at um, sort of all the different testing levels. So we need to be making sure that we're testing from the low level code to looking at the whole data flow process. Now it's important that when you are talking about testing and presenting tests to users and stakeholders is that you're able to translate from both technical and non-technical. So you're, and you're presenting tests in each of these ways to the correct demographic. We can make use of user acceptance testing as well as behavior driven development. Uh, to test our applications and business logic, but we can also use these to gather user requirements. 
And if we're working consistently with the users to gain these requirements and showing them the results of running these tests, we can gain a user's sign off, which is another thing for auditability within a data vault. So an example for user acceptance testing and pay behavior driven development, uh, a recommended tool is Python Behave. It's a tool that we use quite a lot in house um, and we're finding it to be a very, very powerful tool, but this is not the only tool that would be available for this. Cool, so let's take a step back and let's look at actually what is testing and what do I mean by test-driven development, uh, which you're gonna hear a lot about throughout this presentation. So without even knowing it, you're testing already. Okay, you're, you're doing, you're manually testing whatever code you're writing, whatever data manipulations you're doing, you're using print statements, you know, you're checking the out, how things are looking as like in the middle of your function and how, how things are looking as it's coming out at the end of your program. And for example, with a data set, you know, you could be applying some transformations to your data set and then looking at the, the output and checking that it's aggregate, it, how it's aggregating or, you know, that X amount of keys in the initial one appear in the, in the output set, et cetera. So this is all well and good. However, there are some downsides uh, with manual testing and that's that it can be slow and time consuming. And as your complexity of your application grows, you're gonna have quite a low coverage of the functionality of your application as well as your usability. And if you're inserting print statements or you know, commenting out print statements, you're leaving behind redundant code um, and forgotten print statements um, if they get pushed to production, if they're accidentally printing out you know, credentials by accident, then that's gonna get you in a lot of trouble. As well as manual testing is, is it can be unreliable. It, it, it's leaving human error as a, uh, as a factor. You know, it's, you know, with a, with a computer running automated testing, you, you, you're going to have it right or wrong. Whereas human error, you may miss something as you're scanning over something. And as well, it's one off. You can't regressively run tests. So each time you may add a new feature, you can't run a load of tests to make sure that the original functionality is broken. You might be able to do some checks or add some more print statements in, but it just gets very messy. So uh, the approach that we often follow uh, within Datafault is the test-driven development approach. And this is a software development approach that started to pick up traction and become more mainstream in 2003, thanks to a guy called Ken Beck. And the aims of test-driven development were to encourage simple designs and inspire confidence in code. Now, I really like the word inspire confidence in code because it really talks about how this builds up trust within our, our code and our data for both the developers and the users. So a nice definition of test-driven development that I found was that it is a software development process relying on software requirements being converted to test cases before software is fully developed and tracking all software development by repeatedly testing software against all test cases. Now, that's quite wordy, but I've highlighted some key bits that I think really make this definition stand out and are things that we should take away from this. And that is that the software requirements being converted to test cases. So this means this is telling us that our test cases need to be aligning with the requirements from the users about our software. And as well, that we're repeatedly testing against all test cases. So whenever we add a new feature or we do a refactor, we have the ability to run all tests to make sure that all functionality is still working and, uh, and therefore identifying any downstream impacts. So a typical test-driven development lifecycle would, would look like this. Okay, you would start at the top with a new feature and you would add a test. Then the first thing you do after adding that test is that you run all of the tests. However, you've not written any code yet, so you're gonna get a failure, right? So once that's failing, uh, you then can write the application code to pass that test. Now, important sort of 
thing about this step is that let's try and write it in the simplest form because this allows you to keep your code clean and modular. And then once you've got the code, um, you then run all the tests again and then they should pass if the feature has been implemented correctly. If not, you go back a step to, to writing the code. And then finally, once all the tests are passing, this allows you an opportunity to perform any refactors. And then once the refactors are done, I'd say uh, run all tests again, just to make sure. And then that's your life cycle complete for that feature. You move on to the next feature and start it again. So I briefly mentioned earlier about the layers of testing in, in software development. So this is a very simplified version. You may have seen similar versions or slightly different versions, but there's loads of different names or different ways to say a lot of these layers. But uh, boiling it down, um, I've chosen these three ones here. And these are, so we've got the lowest level, we've got the unit tests, and then sort of in the, in the middle ground is our integration tests, and at the top of the pyramid is our end-to-end -end testing. So unit tests. What are unit tests? So unit tests, they apply to our lowest level of code and data. They want to test each function or unit within your code. You can think of unit tests as a, a bottom-up style testing approach. And the goal of unit testing is to isolate each part of the program and show that the individual parts are correct. So we can apply this um, to any application code for data extraction, data load processes. We can also begin to think about, okay, what would define a unit in our data warehouse or our data vault even? And then going on to integration testing, uh, I feel like this has a bit of a crossover with user acceptance testing, but the main aim is that this is testing that multiple of our units are working together correctly. Okay, they we can begin to think that they could maybe test table joins, they could begin to test aggregations. Uh, and if we're building a data warehouse in the cloud, uh, we could begin to test that pieces of our cloud infrastructure are working together. And applying this to a data vault 2.0, which we'll go a bit more into uh, later, is that it could be applied to both our raw, raw vault and business vault. And finally, we get on to our end-to-end -end tests. Now, you'll see a lot, a lot of articles online or people talking about this, and this can be often a portion of testing that is ignored. Um, and it, and this can be because it can have a, a high cost to implement for little reward. But the, the, the gist of end-to-end of -end tests is that it aims to test it from start to finish. So we can begin to think about this in the data vault terms is that a data vault system is auditable. It's a highly auditable data system. So to think about start and finish, we should be able to create in terms of the data vault from the start we can recreate the source data feed uh, from the integration layer. And I'll go more into how we've gone about that within data vaults and the benefits that it's brought to us. So sort of why would we begin to look at applying test-driven development to a data warehousing project? Well, it's important to know that data warehouses you know, these days are becoming more and more automated and more software driven. So why shouldn't we adopt good development practices? You know, test-driven development can inspire confidence in code and users want to have confidence in their data as well. And don't forget that SQL is also a form of code. You know, SQL, we can test using IDEs and linters to syntactically tell us how, how it is. However, we can also use tests to test the behavior that SQL um, demonstrates on the data that it applies to. So treating your data vault project as a software project, we can reap the benefits of these development methods to help produce working software and data whilst also managing user expectations and building trust. Okay, so 
let's uh, begin looking at applying this uh, to the Datafault 2.0 method. So let's start at the bottom of our, our pyramid. Um, what can we test in Datafault 2.0 that we could apply unit testing for? So let's think about in, in our, our data warehouse and in our data vault, what are, apart from individual cells, what are our most granular forms of, of structures? And these are our columns, you know, uh, and going up a level, we can consider a table, a unit as well. We could, you know, begin looking a little bit outside and apply traditional uh, test-driven development techniques to our, our automation or loading script functions. And we can also begin looking at, you know, Data Vault 2.0 as loading patterns. So we're going to be generating a lot of SQL. Uh, so let's test these templates. And a lot of these templates nowadays are using um, templating languages such as uh, Ginger and Pebble. So, and these have the ability to create your own uh, macros or functions. So if you're, you're doing that, then we need to ensure that we're testing those as well because if you do if you are unsure that your lowest level uh, components uh, what they're doing then how can we have faith in, in what we're building on top of that so about how would you go about implementing unit tests within a data warehousing project um, so for a lot of, of the automation scripts or the data, data loading scripts, whatever language you're using for to do that as a unit testing library. For example, we use a lot of Python, so we heavily use the unit test and the PyTest test package. But if you're using something like Java, then have a look for the unit testing packages that they offer there. It's also important to know that if you're using a data transformation tool or a data warehouse, sort of integrated development environment, then they may have certain tests available and assertions built in for you. So for example, we use dbt a lot, uh, both in-house and um, on clients. And dbt has a lot of built-in, uh, both table level and column level assertions, such as uh, unique values on columns, not null values, you know, accepted values, which just you know, in, ensuring that only certain values appear in that column. And it comes bundled with relationship tests as well. So these, I'd say, are arguably, arguably more integration tests than unit tests because they're checking for orphan records between tables. However, oh, they're, they're very, they are very useful. And tools like dbt also have the ability to write your own custom tests as well so you're you're more than able to sort of enhance these tools in order for to enable your testing so how would a unit testing life cycle look on a data warehousing project so again you'd start at the top and i've only changed a little bit here from what i showed you earlier but we start with adding a test, and then we run all these tests expecting a failure. And then you go to create or generate your table uh, to pass that test. And then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we would run all those tests and then refract, refactor um, if necessary. So, in the example of dbt, if any of you are familiar with uh, that tool, would be that we would have maybe our, our schema.yaml file where we'd express our column level tests. We're creating a new table so we can put our metadata meta about our columns in that, in that YAML file and that table. And then we can uh, specify to dbt to run these tests when, when told to do so. However, because we've not actually created or generated that table yet, running those tests would cause a failure. And then we can write the SQL um, or invoke the macro that would be used to generate that table uh, and apply that to your dev environment. And then you can rerun the tests and that's the life cycle that we're looking at here. Okay, so what business value are we delivering with unit tests? 
So unit testing and test-driven development in general uh, helps promote clean coding standards. And it also gets developers to think about the value of code cleanliness. Okay. Think about it in, in this sense. If, if you are a, an existing team and then you're looking to expand and bring a, a new developer in, then how much time do you think it's going to take to get them up to speed if, if you have some good coding practices and standards in place, then you have no coding standards and it's going to, it's a whole mess. Okay. You're going to spend less time integrating them and getting the team back up to the original delivery speed than you are having to get that person up back up to speed so that they can help deliver business value. An advantage of unit testing and is that it can help identify bugs with code and data early on in the development cycle. And this is way before they reach production. There's nothing worse or, sub, you know, or subtracting trust and value from uh, a production data system when you deploy something and then they have a downtime of a few hours because you're having to take away, do, do hot fixes, which again may be untested. Whereas if you have that test harness in place, the majority of those issues are flushed out before it even reaches production. But if there is an issue with production, you can pull that in, create the test scenario that has caused that error, see where it's failing, and then uh, fix it. And then you are permanently capturing that issue. I feel as though unit testing enables agile ways of working. Code and data become flexible. Uh, and this means that you know, if user, user requirements change or, or features change, we can just write more tests. And the refactoring aspect of your code and data becomes much easier because you can test for original functionality as well as new functionality. As well as this, users and developers can trust the code and data at the lowest level. This means that you will then have solid foundations to then build up your, your data warehouse. Okay, so the next part is integration testing. What can we test using integration tests in, a, in data vault? So these can be implemented at multiple points. So we're not quite end-to-end -end testing yet, However, we are looking, beginning to now look at the, the, the units working together. Okay, so we can look at the automation and data loading scripts again, because we're gonna be unit testing the underlying functions and then we want to test that they're all working together. We can test the business fault and the business rule logic that help build that, that business fault. We can also look at the data vault templates, as well as any mark layer logic that helps us build the star schemas, uh, any snowflakes, and also our referential integrity. So our orphan record existence and helping pick them up and identify those. So in terms of implementing this, again, we, we use Python behave, but it is often best to use an external tool for this. It gives you a lot more flexibility. And some data transformation tools and IDEs may have things such as referential integrity tests built in. But uh, integration testing ensures that all the architectural components um, are cooperating with one another. So I briefly mentioned Terraform, and a lot of our clients are moving uh, towards cloud infrastructure. It's really important to know that our our pieces of cloud infrastructure are working together. And also that our piece of cloud infrastructure, you know, that includes stuff, su things such as networking and security. We might need to prove to IT that the infrastructure that we're building is complying with their security policies. An important thing about not just integration testing, but testing in general is that it needs to be non-destructive. We need to be able to run this in our local development environment, as well as in production. You know, your tests need to be idempotent, so they can't, they can't interact with each other. Each test needs to be isolated. So whether within your data warehouse, you create a separate testing area uh, where you can dump your test outputs, 
run assertions on those outputs, and then you can clean up that environment afterwards. And we've been able to create these small environments in both development and in production environments. And a great thing about integration and unit tests is that um, we can actually run these as part of a continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. You know, your continuous integration, um, you can have a testing pipeline that runs your unit tests, your integration tests, and then that if those are all passing, they can be fired off into your delivery pipeline if you choose to do so. Integration tests, this is where we really begin to look at being able to satisfy user requirements. Very rarely will a user request a feature that is a specific unit. A feature usually aligns to the integration testing level. You know, you want to check that multiple units are working together to produce this feature. So a way of handling this is using behave driven development and Python behave is a tool that helps us implement this and behave driven development is sort of a higher order form of test driven development. And it allows us to express user requirements in plain English and in the Gherkin feature file format, which if you are familiar with that, then that's great. However, I will give a very brief example of what that looks like. Uh, and I encourage you to look into, into this. So this gives us the ability to write specifications in our data warehouse uh, in both non-technical business terms, as well as technical terms for our devs. And this really helps us bridge that, that, that technical, non-technical divide. So each feature, scenario, and step in the requir requirements actually points to a piece of backend Python code that enables us to run assertions. So it's essentially a way of abstracting the technical stuff away, but still retaining the requirements of the software. And the beautiful thing with Python behave and Gherkin feature files is that this specification becomes executable. The specifications you build up, you can pull into your development environment and you can run that code. And it will tell you whether that feature has been implemented or not. So to give some very brief examples with Python behave, uh, we have a non-technical business rule here. Uh, so for example, we have a, a business rule that they want to know the monthly employee fuel purchases. Okay. Uh, so in Python behave, you would say, okay, this is a new feature. What's this feature called? And then within a feature, you can have multiple scenarios. So one scenario, the one that we're going to be looking at here, is that an employee purchases fuel using one card. However, there might be a scenario, this is a bit of an edge case, but there could be another scenario that you'd have to account for in this rule that would be, okay, how much fuel does an employee buy in the month where his card expires and he gets a new one? A few days later okay how do you know how can we associate um, the spends of those two different cards to one employee so that might be one scenario but we're just going to look at a simple one here and how we'd express this to the users so we would say in terms of the business we could express this this feature as given an employee has been assigned one fuel card and an employee purchases fuel in a given month when i run the business rule, so that's this, this business rule here, then I expect to see the total amount purchased by the employee for each month. Now, the Gherkin feature file for about the scenario given and when then are all keywords, and they are the, the points that they can look back to your Python code and run the Python code that can set all this up. So this is a high level of abstraction, so you might have to do a lot of work under the scenes, but the business can sit down and look at that and go, yes, that's what I want it to do. However, for the developers, they might have a slightly different understanding of what this means to them. So if we look at the technical example, then we've still got the same feature in the same scenario, but we're going a bit more technical and in, and in depth. So we're actually now going into, okay, in order to build this business logic, what, what entities do we need from the raw vault? Um, 
and what do we expect to see with the output. And the beauty of Python Behave is that you're able to use context tables, so you're enabled to supply test data into these context tables, which are in sort of the bluish color here. Um, and we can use that to insert data into our test area in our warehouse, run, run the business for all the SQL logic, and then go into the test area and run our assertions to assure that it's behaving as expected. So the more technical example would be given an employee exists in the hub employee table and the employee details exist in the satellite employee details and a card exists in the hub card table and the employee has made purchases with that card in the non-historized link fuel purchases table. So when I run that business rule, then I expect to see the total amount purchased by the employee for each month. And this has actually been you, we, we've done something similar to this in, in one of our clients and we had a very positive response. Um, initially, we just had the, these technical examples um, and then we decided, okay, it's worth abstracting these and presenting it to the users. And they were really happy and able to see how, um, what their, their new feature was going to be doing. So the life cycle, I've added a few steps for, for integration testing and, and using this, this way of working. And that's that you start uh, by writing the specifications with the users. Uh, and this may be several meetings over several days. And eventually when you, when you get that specification up, you then get them to sign up on it. And once that's signed off, you can then bring it into your development environment and you can first run all the tests. Now you've not unwritten any code, so you're expecting a failure. And then that's when you begin to write your, uh, your business rule. You, know, you can write the SQL code for that or however you are implementing that, whether it's Python code, et cetera. And then once that's, that's written, you can execute all these tests, uh, perform any refactors as necessary, and if all these tests are passing and it's been signed off by the users, then it's ready to deploy to production. Okay, so business value of integration testing is that it gets our tests to align with the specifications that the users understand. And it ensures that what we're delivering is what the users want. We're not taking any, any guesses here and deploying something and then they turn around and say, that's not what we asked for, which is gonna affect that trust. They're gonna start to think, oh, they're not listening to me. They're not delivering what I asked for. And the beauty of this executable specification, especially with Python Behave, is that it enables the tracking of changes to features and rules due to version control. We're gonna be having this backed up on GitHub, but if down the line, a couple of weeks after deploying it, they go, oh, we want this, this new addition to this, this feature that we had, yeah, okay, that's cool. We rework with that and we commit that. There's a history of that. It's another layer of auditability to our data vault. And it gives us flexibility to adjust to these user requests. And we can make cases and demonstrate that um, within our sprints that, okay, the user requirements change, so we have to pivot for this. It, it keeps us agile, this way of working. So using this way of working, we, with, with tests for business rules, we've been able to release whole marts within weeks. And this has reduced the overall development time and the cost of new features uh, for that client. Okay, so end-to-end, -end, and I've added this a little bit on here, reconciliation testing. So end-to-end -end testing on a data warehouse can be quite cumbersome, especially with the huge volumes of data, of data that you're getting, as well as the many source systems. So if we begin to think about, okay, what do we actually need to test as part of this, this process? The external data loading processes will be covered by their own integration tests, their own user acceptance tests. So we can begin to think, okay, once the data is actually on that platform, in RP, in our persistent staging area, this can be our starting point for our, for our data flow process. So the PSA holds the raw data. So 
even though we're performing transformations on that data in the sense of uh, restructuring it, uh, we should be able to reconcile this with the raw vault. So this means that we can recreate the tables from the raw vault and reconcile them with the persistent staging area. A passing test here will signify no data loss, which will help prove our auditability. Okay. Data vault is, is really big, and Dan Lindstedt is really big on the auditability of data vault 2.0. So this is a really useful thing to have, to have a set of tests that show everything's reconciling once it's been loaded into the raw vault. And having this, developers and users can then have confidence in the business rules they build, knowing that all our little units are working together within that, that raw vault and that the underlying data is of sound quality. Okay, so just having sort of a, a brief sort of schematic of what this might look like is that you have on your data platform, you might have areas such as your PSA that then would flow into your raw vault and then you would have the business vault on top of that. The way we did this is we created a specific area called the reconciliation mark or recon mark where we had uh, we were able to recreate tables from the raw vault in that mark. And then we used um, Python behave on an external VM to pull the data sets together, run SQL queries that would reconcile these two and give us an answer back. Okay, are these two data sets equal? And we, this, <coughs> sorry, this was able to show that we were auditable and that it reinforced confidence in the business's data. Um, and we were able to um, then downstream reconcile legacy reports with uh, the recreated legacy reports that we were asked to do. So we were in a client and they had a load of reports on their legacy system and they wanted to pull them along into the new system that we're building for them. We said, sure, that's, we can do that. Let's, um, let's test this data once we've got it into the raw vault, ensure it's all working. We were able to flush out things such as duplicates, uh, the things that may have caused is issues downstream. Now that meant that when we were recreating the, the business rules, we could know that the, uh, the, the data was sound and it would just be the SQL logic that we may have to actually look at. And removing that, that factor or that variable when looking at, at business rules was a massive help. And by doing this, we were actually even able to identify issues in their legacy business rules. We would say, okay, we've identified this issue, we presented it to them, and now it's down to the business to decide, okay, what is the new behavior you want? Do you want to keep the legacy behavior or do you want to keep the new behavior? which was something that was, was really cool to see, but we might not have been able to do without this sort of testing. So I've gone on about a lot of the testing benefits to the users, but there's also a lot of benefits to the developers. You know, testing gives the developers confidence in their code. There's gonna be a lot less stress when deploying. You know, If you're deploying every at the end of every sprint, it becomes something that just, becomes business as usual. And the, the testable code design that you build encourages cleaner, more modular and decoupled code. And feature integration becomes much easier, enabling easier identification of downstream impacts. And maybe a couple of hours just before um, I, I was about to give this talk, this was something that happened to me. I uh, we. I was running a data load from S3 to Snowflake and stumbled across an issue. Uh, I got that error, added a test, ran it in my, in my test environment, showed, yeah, okay, that's, that is an error. Wrote the code to fix it, ran all the tests, they're passing, pushed it up, run, reran the load, went in all smoothly. So, and that was in the, in the space of about 20 minutes that I was able to diagnose and re-push that and get going again. So that's just sort of the time savings that you can be getting here. Um, it speeds up your development overall, uh, especially as project complexity increases. Okay, initially there might be a, 
a little bit of um, time investment to get your test harness up and running. But if you think as your test harness as, as something that builds up incrementally, then you're not going to be spending too much more extra uh, building up that test harness. And testing, it enables the continuous delivery. That's, that's the important thing, is that it enables you to regularly and continuously pump out features with working code and data. So as DataVault is an agile methodology, how can we incorporate testing into our agile sprints? So there's four key, key areas which we could incorporate these in, and that's our planning. Now we want to include the time to test in your estimates. Uh, same as you would with document, documentation. And there are, you know, and good tests can act as documentation as well, but it doesn't replace documentation. And then we've got the implementation. Test as you go. Don't leave it until the end. Follow the testing cycles that you've seen here today. Um, They'll, it will really make your life easier. And once you get into that pattern as well, it really does pick up in speed and makes your, your life a whole lot easier. The acceptance criteria um, of your user stories. So a feature or a business rule, I would say is not completed until all tests are passing for that. And then once all the tests are passing, that's a sign the feature is ready for delivery. And you can then begin delivering new features every spring. So when you're starting a new project, you may have some potential pushbacks. And here's just some considerations uh, to think about. So some of the pushbacks may be, you know, oh, we won't be able to deliver as many features as quickly, or, you know, that's QA's job. It's a waste of time. So we, the thing to think about is, okay, what do you think is going to provide more value to the business? smaller but regular and tested data, data releases that delivers value or feature releases that are untested and become more unpredictable as the project scales and complexity increases you know um how are we going to you know as the project increases in complexity how are you going to know that this new feature you're going to push is not going to break everything and then you're going to have to spend two to three days fixing that. Okay, so the delivering value, value through, delivering business value through testing, just a slightly recap of some of the other things that um, weren't directly touched upon. So there's uh, people often ignore testing because they, they think it's going to slow them down. However, if you look at the long term of it, even though you might be able to pump out more features initially quite quickly if you're not testing, as you go past that, you're going to be building up a massive amount of tech debt that is going to really hinder you. Whereas taking that extra time to test will enable you to get, get up and running and then continue to keep running and, and deliver. Uh, to your to your users. However, so as you speed up, it encourages you to align development with user requirements, build modular maintainable code, make sure you test as you go, build good practices, isolate, diagnose, and fix errors rapidly. That's another thing that is that really shows your ability as a team is that if, there, if an error does slip through, it's your ability to, to pull that in-house, fix it and deploy it back very quickly, minimizing that downtime, bringing more value to the business because they're not having that downtime. You can also verify that new code doesn't break existing functionality and you're constantly and effectively communicating with users. Your rate of delivery will remain consistent and even increase. So as your data warehouse scales, you can have confidence in new features, refactors, and trust. So I have mentioned a couple of times you can use testing for uh, proof of compliance with regulations and standards, and this can apply to whether you're testing infrastructure, data, or code. Tests are evidence to demonstrate that you are compliant. So you know you could have 
a, uh, a need to remove uh, personally identifiable information. You could, you could have a test proving that you're, you're doing that. If you need to show your infrastructure meets certain security qualities, you can again have a, have a test for that. You could even feed these test results back into the data vault and then hook these up to a dashboard and have a report of which tests are currently passing and failing. But that's a conversation for another time. Okay, so just to summarize uh, everything that we've been over today. So I hope that you've, you've learned something and can take something away from this, this presentation uh, about the origins and the layers of testing and software development and how we've gone about applying these testing practices uh, to data vault projects. I hope I've shown the value in incorporating testing uh, into your agile sprints and how it can help you speed up your delivery uh, even in the long run. And it can help your team become more agile and flexible to changing user requirements. And finally, testing can help prove auditability and compliance with regulations.